thanks everybody for joining uh, this Midwest Azure and Microsoft 365 user group uh, meeting for today. Today's kind of a special meeting, you know, kind of a week of week of Christmas. So happy holidays to everybody. Uh, we, you know, we had to reschedule because I was teaching last week and didn't have uh, have the proper time uh, available to uh, to host the meeting. But uh, Peter was able to adjust his schedule and and join us as well. So uh, I want to thank uh, thank Peter, and we'll introduce him here momentarily. A uh, quick couple quick things. You know, I always like to talk about our group mission. You know, we're a learning environment, uh, not uh, a sales environment. So. You won't hear any sales pitches on these calls. These are, uh, you know, for uh, community content for helping, you know, on a monthly basis. Sometimes even a couple times a month we've been doing lately because we've had so many people want to uh, contribute content. Uh, you know, we've been uh, we want to expand knowledge around Azure, Microsoft 365 across uh, across the Midwest and U.S. and around the world. So everybody is welcome to share a session if they want to. Uh, want to submit and we'll uh, we'll get you on the schedule so uh so thanks everybody for attending our full schedule is available uh as well on the on our website and uh we have a couple of sessions that are coming up in january as well so on uh, windows virtual desktop as well as as using uh azure functions with web apps so uh Quickly, before I turn things over to Peter, I wanted to recognize and uh, provide some announcements of some of our new board members. Uh, we got Brett Bozic from Skylines Academy, Brian Gorman from Opsgility, uh, Shannon Keen from Microsoft, and Nick Collier from uh, Skylines Academy uh, have all uh, come on as board members to help uh, continue to uh, spread the spread the knowledge and everything for uh, for this user group and. Uh, help me with growing the user group, and I want to thank uh, Skylines Academy for uh, for signing on as a sponsor as well. And uh, last thing, I know Peter, you're involved in the MC2 MC group, uh, so I figured I'd, I'd give you guys a plug on that. I, you know, and I uh, didn't know if you were involved in any other groups, but I wanted to make sure, wanted to make sure that if uh, if I know a uh, a speaker is involved in. Their own user group that I, their own user group, and somehow uh, that I that you are uh, recognized also. So I won't go through this slide too much. I'll let Peter speak to himself. I know he's got a slide on his deck, but uh, but we want to welcome Peter de Tender here from Belgium to uh, virtually from Belgium. He didn't uh, didn't fly across here, but uh, uh, but uh, welcome him. I wish I could. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, as you were saying before, uh, with family and it, right in the Midwest, uh, yourself that uh, unfortunately uh, with travel and everything couldn't do that. But uh, but it's a pleasure to have him here, and he's going to talk today about uh, container alphabet soup. So uh, we'll let we'll let him identify all these acronyms as he goes through his uh, his presentation here today. So I will turn the control over to you, Peter, and you can go ahead and share your screen, tell everybody about yourself, and we'll go from there. Sounds good. Thank you for the nice introduction already. And let's see how supportive PowerPoint is. I think everything should be up by now. So um, yes, well, first of all, Dwayne, thanks for um, having me. And yeah, as mentioned, I wish I could do this as an in-person delivery, but we're going to cross that off for somewhere 2021 and then uh, doing some more fun stuff in person. But that shouldn't block me from inspiring you about the amazing, but somehow, I guess, also complex world um, that's called containers and even maybe more complex running containers on top of Azure. So I'm going to try in the next 50, maybe 60 minutes, uh, depending on how demos are going, to um, walk you through and hopefully that's going to clarify quite a lot. So in a nutshell, this is what I have in scope for the next 60 minutes, let's say 50 minutes and about 10 minutes Q&A at least. So first of all, what is containers? Why should we use them? Um, like where do they fit in your day-to-day -day, uh, business model? Then moving over to what do I need to actually build a container? Like where do I get started in, in creating them? And from there, we're gonna jump to Azure and I'm gonna show you how you can use your container images 
running the no measure in a couple of different scenarios depending on characteristics and capabilities that you might be looking for. Well, a little bit about myself, but I'm not going to spend too much time. Um, we have the slides available, even if you want to rewatch this as a recording. I guess it's all fine. But in meantime, a bit more than um, a year, I think close to 18 months actually, uh, within Microsoft as a FTE, um, Azure Technical Trainer, which means that I'm literally providing Azure Technical Training every single week to larger customers and partners. Um, initially, only EMEA when we could still travel. But in meantime, we completely moved to the virtual delivery world, and it means that we can train out of our own time zone, but the audience can be from anywhere in the world. Before that, I was running my own company as a Microsoft consultant a long time ago on Microsoft Data Center Technologies about seven years back, switched to the Azure platform and somehow fell in love with it and still enjoying it. And you might recognize me from community, was an MVP, MCT4, I think 11 years, somewhere coming April. And in the free time that I had while I was traveling um, to somehow keep me away from hotel bars and boring airports, uh, I started writing books on Microsoft technology and in the meantime published, um, I think seven of them writing on the eighth one that should be out somewhere March next year. So uh, still keeping me busy. Uh, feel free to reach out. You already have my contact details on here. Twitter, um, email works. I'm not on Snapchat or Instagram because I think I'm getting a bit too old for that. So um, that's about me. Obviously, it's not about me. It's about running containers on Azure. Now, if you're still wondering where containers can help you in, in yeah, running your applications in a more efficient way, um, long time ago, and a lot of organizations are still using it today, is all the way on the left-hand side where you're going to run your virtual machine base. Um, workloads. Mm -hmm. So first option by moving to, to cloud scenarios like Azure could be uh, running virtual machines on a cloud-based platform. Nothing really wrong with that, but it's not keeping uh, Gartner happy because they like to talk about application modernization or digital transformation. And obviously it's not just about um, using buzzwords, it's really about providing um, benefit for your organization as a developer, but also as a system administrator where containers could actually yeah, simplify the work, although it could um, could become a little bit complex as well. Now, if you need to start wondering like where exactly in this cloud environment uh, could I position containers? To me, it's really somewhere in the middle between running a virtual machine where it's still a little bit closer to a VM, although it's not a VM, but I'll talk about it, but it's not as like serverless as a microservice or literally like um, Azure Functions, Logic Apps, or Lambda on AWS, for example. Now, what makes it still pretty close to virtual machines? It's mainly because the the rough architecture is, is somehow still the same. So if you map the, the two architectures, it's running on top of some platform that I describe as the, the vis physical server here, where in a virtual machine world like VMware, Hyper-V, you're going to build your host operating system, Windows or Linux machines, and you install the hypervisor. And as long as we're all running the same hypervisor, we can exchange virtual machines. Where the virtual machine is a full operating system, you install binaries like a .NET web application or a SQL database server, for example, or a file server or anything you want to run inside the virtual machine. Now, the nice thing is on the, the container side, you're technically running something similar, but the footprint is a little bit different. So instead of running a hypervisor, we're going to rely on the Docker engine. And it also means that as long as we're all running the same Docker engine, we can again exchange workloads. So we're going to build a container image and we can share it around. And the other nice thing is that a lot of different cloud vendors or even on-prem environments are also supporting that Docker engine. So nothing would block you like in some of my demos later on. I'm running Windows 10, but if you run like an Ubuntu client, if you want to deploy your own Windows server, as long as you install that Docker engine, you're good to go and you can run your containers. I want to take to run your containers on Azure. That's the, I would say, the, the main challenge that I want to highlight in this session. The challenge comes in because there's not just like one single Azure container service. 
that's partly where all the acronyms are coming from. So the first option is um, ACI, that's Azure Container Instance. Super easy in just less than a minute, whenever you hand over your container image to Azure, inside Azure Container Instance, you push the start button and it starts running. Or you could also move it and somehow, I would say, fool the platform a little bit. And instead of running app services that you might know from web apps, primarily, but also uh, functions, API apps are uh, part of that umbrella. But if you think like running a web application that before was running on a virtual machine, you could now move it into app services and making use of all the core characteristics of app services. Where now later on, I'm gonna show you how we can reuse the same container image. And instead of running it as a native source code, you could now run it as part of app services and reusing quite a lot of the capabilities from app services, but it's not using source code. If you need some more, I would say complex, more advanced scalability, high availability, you could look into something called Service Fabric. Now Service Fabric is a lot similar to probably the most popular container service in cloud today called Kubernetes, where Service Fabric is a lot like Kubernetes in the architecture, the concept perspective, but it's coming from Microsoft. And it's not just specifically built for running containers. Um, it actually existed already a long time ago before containers. And the downside was that it was typically targeted to run .NET applications. So that's why I wouldn't say it's, it's the most popular one, but if you're a bit familiar with Microsoft and .NET world, you probably um, are quite familiar with Service Fabric. Then Kubernetes, I'll talk about it more towards the end of the session, but that's literally running um, a full scalable orchestrated um, environment supporting Windows-based and Linux-based containers. And from here, you got a whole bunch of other ones where I'm not gonna talk about it throughout the session because it's only 50 minutes. And also because they have one thing in common and that's where you're gonna deploy a virtual machine-based architecture. So if you look at like Red Hat OpenShift, it's building up a container-alike service platform where under the hood, it's relying on a virtual machine, Linux-based uh, Red Hat operating system infrastructure. Or if you look at Docker uh, Swarm, if you look at Mesosphere, they're all based on a virtual machine, typically Linux architecture. And again, you could also deploy your Windows machines, uh, Windows Server, installing the Docker Enterprise Edition, and from there running it as a container host. And then a little bit like the, the belly of the, the container service, I would say, is a container registry. I describe it as a library, almost like a, a storage um, repository that allows you to store images. And from there, you're gonna hand them over to any container hosting service that you want. Where within the Azure world, the, the recommended option I would say is Azure Container Registry. I'll talk about it a bit later on. Or if you want, you could also use the public um, Docker Hub. And that's where um, a lot of pre-baked images are already available. So in short, it's helping you in a small basic setup using container instance, mm -hmm. all the way to a more advanced complex enterprise ready um, orchestrated scenario using Kubernetes and anything in between based on your requirements, based on the cost model, based on um, the needs that you're looking for. Now that's all nice to know as an introduction, but the starting point is like, yeah, where do I get started, right? Like, how do I get my container images? So the first thing again is it's all based on Docker. So for now, I think I can say it, it's really uh, the standard of your organization around containers where you're gonna bring in your source code, you're gonna squeeze it into a container, and I'll show you uh, that in a minute how it works. And from there, once you have your container image, you can hand it over to a registry, and from there, eventually running your applications. Where Docker is the engine and the company behind the engine as well, open source their model, which obviously makes it quite interesting from a user adoption and 100% supported on Azure. And you could also create Windows-based containers where the operating system obviously is Windows dependent or Linux dependent. And Windows 10 actually has some um, nice way to, to uh, deal with that as well. And that's what I'm gonna show you. Now the downside 
if you really need to talk about some downside at least, is your entry point is managing your Docker environment using the Docker command line. So if you're a bit familiar with PowerShell, if you are familiar with some CLI on Ubuntu or maybe from Azure, it shouldn't all be that hard. And a lot of the, the comments are actually quite straightforward and transparent no matter what platform you're using. So the starting point is installing Docker on your developer or workstation if you want. And from there, you start managing it using command line. If you use it from the command prompt, that's what I'm going to do, or PowerShell, or from within uh, like a Windows and Linux environment like WSL, or even on a full-blown um, Mac OS or Ubuntu client, that's all um, giving you the same experience. So that makes it quite transparent. I have my Docker running. Let's see if I can show you. So I'm running Docker Desktop. It's the free edition. You could also download Docker Enterprise if you want to run it on top of a server operating system, Windows or Linux. And um, that comes with a fee, but it's mainly the support uh, you're paying for. So from here, this is my, um, I would say, basic console where technically you don't really need to do um, a lot from here besides going back to your uh, command line environment. And you would probably start with validating the service, although as long as you see that little wheel showing up, everything should be up and running. So Docker info is the starting point where it's going to tell you how many containers you have, how many images you have, the version number you're using. So pretty uh, basic scenario. Next, another interesting one is uh, Docker images. I already have a couple of them and it should become a little bit more clear later on what they're actually doing. So let's say I want to run like a Ubuntu client. So I can do Docker run Ubuntu. And it's going to tell me like I don't find it, but I can pull it. So what it means, remember about my high level overview, we have something called Docker Hub and that's like an online marketplace where you can just grab images. So in this scenario, Ubuntu, the, the vendor, uh, canonical at least, provides a stripped down um, Docker image that looks and feels like an Ubuntu client operating system squeezed inside the container. So it tells me like I'm already downloading. I recognize some weird stuff that's already existing. No idea what that really means, but I'll talk about it. But we don't really know if something happened. So let's try that again. Where this time it is not really doing a lot, right? So does this mean like, oh, wait a minute, but you're using Windows 10. You're doing something Ubuntu Linux alike. So it makes sense that it's not working, right? Now I can show you that it is actually working. So I'm going to open a second command prompt or PowerShell. Doesn't really matter. It's the same idea where I could um, do Docker container list. And you can see that I have one container running, but that's not my Ubuntu one. So what's actually happening? Let's check back in the archive. A lot of containers running from previous demos. And I can see up here that my Ubuntu was running like 38 seconds ago and the other one like a minute ago, but they're not running anymore. Now, why not? Because we didn't really tell the container what to do. So that's quite important. The easiest way to do that is running it in interactive mode. Where this time I'm telling Ubuntu container like, hey, come up and give me your um, bash command prompt. That's the, the shortcut for interactive. Where right now I'm inside my uh, container. From here, I could run, for example, top one of the most basic Linux comments to validate like system resources. I could do something else like VI, but that's not really in there. Or I could do curl and that's not in there either. So that's why before I talked about a stripped down container where it has a lot of the capability. It's a yeah, stripped down Linux operating system, but nothing would block me from here to inject um, capabilities like installing um, new software, new comments that would all be possible. Or I could exit and from here, I'm again on my local machine. 
That's Ubuntu I could do uh, Docker run interactive Java. Same story, so it's not recognizing Java on my machine, but it already has a lot of what they call layers. Why? Because the Java um, pre-compiled Docker image is based on um, an Ubuntu operating system that already has the Java, I don't know exactly which version, probably the latest one in there. And about 80% of the container image is already recognized because I already have it on my local machine. And it's only the last one or two layers typically that define the specifics between a generic um, operating system like container and the specific applications you want to run. Now, that's all fine. If you would go to the Docker Hub, you're going to find like, I don't know, 2 million images where 90% of them are not always trustworthy. That's another risk in, in container world. But where it becomes a bit more exciting is if you have your own applications. So my example is running on a Visual Studio, but doesn't need to be Visual Studio, just a, an easy example where I'm running a .NET application. For anyone who's a little bit into .NET development, um, you can recognize my app settings file where I'm pointing to an Azure SQL database. I got my views up here and somewhere you can validate my NuGet packages and like a full blown .NET application. So from here, I wanna squeeze this into a container. Now the benefit about Visual Studio is that first of all, I can pretend being a developer, which I'm not but also because I can use the GUI from Visual Studio and add Docker support. Now this works because I'm running Docker on Windows 10 together with Visual Studio. And from there, it's gonna ask me like, how do you want me to compile this container? Do you wanna run it on top of a Windows platform? Do you wanna run it on top of Linux? So how is it possible that I can run a Linux based container on top of Windows? It's a little bit of magic running Docker desktop on Windows where it actually gives you two options to emulate the Linux operating system. The first option is um, deploying Hyper-V on top of your Windows client or server. And in the back end, it's running um, an Ubuntu uh, Linux operating system with some Docker magic in there. Or what I'm using is the WSL, so the, the Windows um, subsystem for Linux that's completely integrated with uh, Windows environments. From here, if I push Linux or Windows, it's creating a Docker file. And just to speed up the demo a little bit, because it's not 100% about Docker, it's about everything that follows. But if you miss the basics, then probably everything else could become a bit complex. Now, what it's gonna do here is allowing you to um, build up your deployment, um, or your compiled step-by-step -step scenario that moves the source code into a container. So what it's doing is grabbing a base container. In this scenario, it's a .NET Core 3.1. So it's a pre-baked Microsoft container. And the only thing it supports, the only thing it recognizes is offering me the ASP.NET 3.1, like a stripped down Windows operating system and having the .NET 3.1 ASP. From there, I'm gonna inject the .NET Core SDK 3.1 and copying my source code. So it's a pretty big application. It's like a e-commerce example I'm using. So a lot of different modules in there. And from there, I'm gonna run .NET Restart. That's like a command line option for .NET applications. I'm gonna run .NET Build. And I'm finally, I'm gonna run .NET Publish. So all this is happening inside my Docker environment, and the outcome is a pre-baked, um, compiled Docker image. And from there, I can start using it. Now, the funny thing is that although it's all integrated in Visual Studio, that this image is actually not working. So it took me like a weekend figuring out why it was not working. If I would push the Docker button here, depending a little bit on how far it gets, but this typically takes a, a few minutes. Everything is working fine in Visual Studio debugging environment. From there, moving the containers is not working anymore. So I was like, what's going on, right? Until I find out like, you know what? 
I'm not going to use the wizard and I just going to build a Docker file myself. So just another example here, I can use another smart editor. I'm using Visual Studio Code. And what I'm doing here is almost the same, but not using like Visual Studio 2019 intelligence. But in short, it's still doing the same. It's grabbing this .NET SDK. It's copying my solution. Next, it's copying everything from source to target. So from my local development station into the container, running .NET restore, running .NET publish, and eventually copying my simple commerce application. And most important, all the way at the end, the entry point, that's where once my container comes up, it knows like, oh, I need to execute .NET.exe and grabbing that simple commerce, that's my e-commerce example, um, web host application. So there's like 500 different ways to get started with your Docker file, but just keep in mind that it could take a little bit of challenge to um, actually come up with a workable version. So from here it's building and it's compiling some Docker commands and eventually my container will come up, but I'm not going to wait for that for now at least. So in short, the Docker file, it obviously takes a lot more than a two minute demo on the Docker file. It could actually be easy or a bit harder or like super hard, but just some easy comments that um, you could become familiar with is the from, like where do you want me to get started? You could add a label to the container, like I'm adding if it's a dev and test container, a Q&A container, ready for production or anything else. Then running is used for executing comments, like my um, .NET build, .NET publish. This could be um, NPM start. This could be something on uh, Maven for Java or anything else. Defining um, additional environment variables is also an interesting where you could hand over like um, database connection strings. If my web app needs to connect to a Docker file, uh, needs to connect to a SQL database or any other flavor not that important. What I'm using right now just to, to make it a bit straightforward is hard coding my database connection string in my app settings, which means that it's also becoming um, hard coded inside my eventual Docker image. If you don't want to use it because you need to switch between different database scenarios, you can define it as an environment variable. So if you're a little bit, um, I would say familiar with um, bash files, maybe PowerShell scripts, or overall command line syntax to run, compile your applications. That's almost what the Docker file is doing. And then all the way at the end, once your Docker file is up and running, you need to build your container image. And that would use the Docker build with some label that you want to use. And the dot all the way at the end here means that it needs to grab all the source files from within my um, application folder. Now again, since the app is, I would say quite big, it's about 400 megs, I think, in size. I already have that image available. So we're going back to Docker images. If it wants. It's probably still busy out of Visual Studio. There we go. And the outcome from my e-commerce example is a couple of different options here. This is the output from Visual Studio. So it's my simple commerce web host. That's the name of my Visual Studio um, uh, project and solution. And it's still in a dev stage. Why? Because I didn't really validate. I could add new labels to make it production ready. And eventually I gave it a bit more descriptive name. And that's the PD tender simple commerce container that I also moved into Docker Hub. So later on, if you want to go through some of the demos um, that I'm using and you need some, I would say more fancy container than the Ubuntu one that you find all over the place uh, or the Nginx um, is a typical one, feel free to reach out to the Docker Hub and grab that simple commerce one. Yeah, but let's see how far we are. Where's my PowerPoint? Up here. So now we have our baseline scenario. We know what a container is. We know how to 
move from source code into container. So let's take it one step further and running our container in the Azure platform. Where again, the starting point could be some kind of registry. My preference would be Azure Container Registry. It's the, the image storage um, service for containers in Azure. It doesn't mean that you need to use it um, to take the next step and actually run your containerized workloads, but it just makes sense that if you're going to use container services on Azure, most probably it could be the easiest way is moving to container registry. Although it interacts with the Docker Hub, or if you have the um, URL and credentials to connect to an on-prem container registry or AWS or Google Cloud or any other cloud environment, then you're um, still good to go. So what is Container Registry? It's an Azure service that allows you to store images. From there, you're going to hand over the images to your container hosting service. So Container Registry is not running the container itself. It's literally a landing page for your images, where there's um, well, a lot more to talk about than just one or two slides, but the core idea is that when you deploy your Container Registry, you need to decide on um, a flavor, a SKU, and the recommendation would be premium, not because it's the most expensive option, but it gives you the most enterprise ready features. Basic is not supported for production, interesting for testing. Standard is okay, but it's not giving you a lot of interesting capabilities. So try to remember like if I deploy ACR, um, I need to go for premium. And although it's the most expensive, it's not super um, expensive. So the registry becomes our central point for storing images. That's what we call the registry. Within we have a repository, could be a collection of a single container image or multiple containers like in a um, front-end, back-end containerized workload scenario where you're going to run multiple containers together and that becomes your workload. And relying on images, that's your offline um, compiled application or database or anything else uh, as a workload. That's scary. Oh, that was my container. It's probably still trying to come up. So you could create a new registry now to speed it up. I already created one. You can use PowerShell, Azure CLI um, or the portal where similar to other Azure resources, it needs a location, it needs a descriptive name. And from there you can get started. So based on the uh, flavor you select, it's going to provide you some interesting features where the two ones I want to highlight at least for this session is the available space. So the premium one gives you 500 gigs, knowing that my application container is about 250 megs in size. It allows me to run a lot of different versions. From there, um, what also could become quite interesting is security integration. Now, why is that important? Because you cannot really touch your container image anymore. So once it's compiled, you can create a new one, but you cannot really make changes to an existing one. On the other side, like I mentioned, you have the, the 2 million something uh, public Docker Hub container images where you don't always know, like, can I actually trust them? Like what's running inside? I could easily create a container called uh, PD Tender Simple Commerce. And I told you that anyone can use it, but in the end, you don't really know what I'm doing inside that container. Like what happens if you start it up right? And that's what um, the container registry can help you with is integrating like a code vulnerability scanning, identifying together with Azure Security Center. If you got any suspicious code, maybe some outdated um, language for your application that you're using that could compromise your um, container. So similar to what a developer would do out of like Azure DevOps or any other DevOps environment or using security plugins in Visual Studio, for example. So from here, we're going to move our container into the container registry. And what we need to do to, to make that happen is tagging our container image. So the PD tender, this one, we need to tag it with the name of the container registry. It's not, I would say, that the most um, important part around security, but if the name of the container image is not reflecting the name of the registry, it's not even accepting it. 
So what you need is docker tag, that's the command, and providing the name of your container registry. From here, you can move it up, and that's docker push. And based on the name, that's the public name of my container image, it knows like what it needs to do. Now it looks like everything is moving, but eventually it's not because all the way at the end, it tells me like I need authentication. Now, why is that? Because Docker by itself doesn't really know about my container registry. So from here, it would require AZ ACR login with the name of my container registry. Yes, something like this. And the group. Where it's going to rely on my Azure admin credentials. So the assumption is that obviously role based access is in place, that you have the admin permissions to connect to the registry, and everything's working fine. So I can run my Docker push again. And obviously, since I already prepped my demo, everything's already up and running in my registry, and that's what makes this uh, process quite fast. So from here, I have my container image. If it wants to open, come on. I can use the latest version if you add like a DevOps scenario and you want to use versioning. You could have like the latest one, but you could also have like the 1.0, 1.10, 1.02, and so on and so on. So from here, let's take it one step further and actually running a container where I need to provide a name. So this could be the Midwest Azure and Office 365 user group live container. That's the hardest part, coming up with unique names for all the demos. I'm running .NET Core inside my app, and it means that I could run it on top of Linux or Windows. I just go for Linux for now. I could run it anywhere in Azure I want. And next, I can also define some compute um, options. Eight cores and up to 16 gigs, that's the maximum. And I could also define if I wanna run it like public facing, allocating an Azure public IP, if I want to keep everything internal, and what port I want to use for my application. So this is starting from registry, immediately moving it into an instance. And just because it's not taking a lot of time, I can show you, no, oh, it's container instance. where I can do the exact same thing. Defining some additional options, like the resource group I want to use. Let's create a new one. The, something like this. Another container, where this time, I can show you a bit more options, like where does my registry actually knows, uh, or my instance actually knows where to grab containers from. So we got a few couple quick start images, pretty boring, but it's literally spinning up a web app with an image. Container registry, that's what I'm using. Use this ACR, grab the simple commerce, or why not picking another one, running it on Linux and changing the size again. Defining network options, so public, private already talked about. I could define additional ports, and I can also define the environment variables. So if I don't specify them as part of my Docker file compilation, I could move them into my container instance. And defining this container connects to one database, the other one connects to another database, and so on and so on. And let's create it. I'm not too worried about cost because running container instance is quite affordable and you also pay per second. So as long as you remember to actually shut them down, it could actually be a pretty affordable solution. So I talked about registry, talked about instance, not too much about slides, but another interesting phenomenon is where the two worlds, Docker and ACI, are coming together. So this was announced only in 
the end of August, uh, mid-September during uh, the Docker conference. And what it allows you to do is managing and interacting, like deploying, running container instance um, services, but all managed directly from within the Docker environment. So you don't have to go through a Docker registry scenario where you first create a registry. Next, you need to uh, run the Docker push. Next, you're going to create a new instance. All that is just managed um, by itself. So let's give that another try. So it starts with um, Docker context. That's the scenario we're going to use. But before that, I need to authenticate. Where now I can just go to Docker command line and authenticating where it's going to ask for my Azure credentials and authenticating. Well, now I can do Docker context create ACI. That's the, the starting keyword and some name. So let's do the Midwest ACI. ACI. So it's going to recognize my credentials and it's offering me a list of um, Azure subscriptions because I have a couple of different ones. It allows me to move to an existing resource group or create a new one. And that's pretty much it. So now I could do Docker context list where I have the default one that's on my local machine where now I'm going to switch. Midwest ACI. And from here, Docker run, what we did before. Uh, port 80 on the outside, port 80 on the inside for my image and running my container where just for the ease of typing, I'm going to grab the one from the Docker Hub. But this could also be the one from my Docker registry. So from here, it's spinning up a new image or at least spinning up a new container instance, reusing the same image that's part of my local environment. Which means if I now switch back, this deployment is fine. So let's quickly have a look. 15 minutes, we're gonna make it. So it's gonna start up my container. And eventually it will come through. So back to that um, context. So what it did is creating this um, GUID for my resource group. And within it's creating my cool beaver. And up here you can see that it did create a cool beaver. That's the unique naming convention for any Docker image. And within. I can see that it's running. Now there's also some logging, some monitoring um, out of the service, but you could also move to like Azure Monitor or Log Analytics, where you can see that it's pulling the image successfully pulled, starting the container and creating and eventually running it. I can also see that my ASP.NET Core is waiting to be used and it's waiting on port 80. So if all goes fine, I got a new public IP. I actually hope that my database string was correct because I didn't really validate out of Visual Studio, but we should be okay. There we go. That's just a integration where I'm defining what kind of database information it needs to pull up. And eventually there should be some web shop coming up. Remember, I only gave it like one CPU and one gig of RAM, so it's not the fastest example, but this is my e-commerce uh, website where the product information is coming from a SQL database, could be any other database flavor. Images are coming from um, Azure Blob Storage. And from here, I could add an, I'm quite sure in the virtual world, you already know what an e-commerce platform looks like. Where again, the benefit is that out of this Docker ACI 
context, it's taking away a lot of the, the additional manageability that you need to integrate, creating the registry, defining um, the Docker push command, and so on and so on. You could make that comment a bit more intuitive. So the only thing I did is Docker context to use, spin up a container where it's creating that um, GUID-based name for the resource group. You could make it a bit more, um, I would say, managed control by adding parameters like the name for the resource group, the location where you want to spin it up, and so on. So it's not just like doing its own thing. So that's ACI, quick and easy on how to deploy containers. The other option, web app for containers. I don't have the time to talk about web apps, but it allows you to run about any application language, moving it into web apps, allowing for high availability, scalability, integrated backups, um, Azure AD integration for authentication and anything else, but it's still source code based. Where now you could grab any Docker image you already have, that you compiled yourself and running it as a web app. So almost like treating it as a web app, but it's not a web app, it's based on a container. So a couple of ideas. If you know how to deploy a web app out of Visual Studio, VS Code, or any other development environment, integrating with DevOps, it's 100% the exact same thing. Relying on all web app um, service or app service high availability, backup, so pretty much everything I mentioned. And most important, it's almost web apps as you know it, but this time it's container based. So let's do another one. Got like three more demos to go through. So we should be able to make it if you want to hang around for a few more minutes for Q&A, where we're going to deploy a new web app. Again, this could also be CLI PowerShell based, doesn't really matter. The web app for, let's call it Dwayne. Dwayne is not using web apps apparently. In the code world, you would select your runtime, where now it's all integrating with Docker containers, running on Linux, where I want to run it. Let's go for, my mouse is failing a little bit, so that's not, I'll keep it running in central US, why not? We're next to same questions that I showed you in the um, detailed option from ACI. Running a single container or Docker Compose, that's the scenario where you have uh, multiple containers like a front end and a back end, grabbing it from the registry. And from here, I know it becomes a little bit boring because it's the exact same thing I already showed you. Integrating with monitoring, which means um, it allows you to enable application insights. Where again, told you, we're going to treat your container as a web app and deploying it. So this is going to kick off, takes again like a, a minute or two, and eventually it would give me the same workload. Now, what if you need more complex scenarios? But well, nobody really needs more complex scenarios, but we all know that the complex scenarios are there where you could have a whole bunch of containers running. Like it needs to be high available. It needs to be performant. I want to make sure that um, whenever something goes wrong in the platform, that my application is not down. In case of ACI, if I stop my ACI, the container is not running anymore. If I stop my Azure Web Apps, it's not running anymore. So it's not giving me ultimate high availability. Or what if I need a more isolated scenario? I could use Web App VNet private endpoints, but it's not 100% like I'm taking control of the, the full network stack. And anything else you could come up with that moves you to a full um, orchestrator. So what is an orchestrator? It's um, an architecture where you have a brain, it's described as the master, and you're going to deploy additional worker nodes. So the nice thing is that although the diagram could look a little bit overwhelming, you actually don't have to worry about a lot of those components because that's what Azure Kubernetes gives you. It's running Kubernetes, which is a container orchestrator. Integrating with Docker, it's also integrating with some other um, container engines in meantime. And from there, allowing you to spin up high available containers across different worker nodes. Where a worker node under the hood is an Azure virtual machine running some Linux operating system, having the Kubernetes integration service, and you're going to manage it as an Azure service. 
running it public facing, that's what I'm going to do. Um, running it private where you got um, even the combination between running public facing web app front end, maybe some database back end, all running inside Kubernetes. But again, the complexity um, is somehow uh, being removed because you're going to use it as a service. So the starting point is deploy AKS using portal, CLI, Terraform, DevOps, pipelines, whatever mechanism you use to deploy your Azure uh, resources. And from there, you're going to define how many nodes you want to use, a single one, multiple ones, where again, under the hood, it's using virtual machines. And once you have your container infrastructure up and running, that's where you're going to move to an in Kubernetes uh, deployment. The easiest option is using a YAML file. You could make it more advanced, more enterprise ready using Helm charts or even integrating with, for example, a DevOps like scenario. And in meantime, supporting Linux and Windows all the way back to the beginning of my session where our Docker desktop could already offer that. So you start with an end to end environment. So there's something for the developer, meaning this is my source code. I'm going to squeeze that into a container that we call pods in an AKS world. And from there, we're going to move it into container registry manually in the exact same way that I showed you, or maybe integrating with some pipeline scenario, integrating that YAML or Helm chart. And that's where my Kubernetes cluster knows, like I need to grab this image from the registry and I need to start running it. Where within the Helm chart uh, configuration file or the YAML definition file, I can already manage high availability. And I'll show you that in my next demo. So it's um, almost like infrastructure as code where the sysadmins are deploying the service, handing it over, integrating from the developer side, running it, managing it, and eventually monitoring it, where again, Azure Monitor together with Log Analytics, your trusted, familiar Azure monitoring capability is also becoming transparent for managing your Kubernetes environment. So from here, I'm going to switch to my last demo in the last three minutes that I have before Q&A. So in the meantime, the mouse is back. That's always nice. So this was my container out of ACI. And that's not what I was expecting, but it's probably still loading somewhere, but that's perfectly fine. I already have my Kubernetes up and running. Um, initially, when you build this from scratch, it takes about 10, 15 minutes. So I'm not going to bore you with all that. And from here, I have my Kubernetes namespace. Now, if you're a bit familiar with Kubernetes outside of Azure, you might think about like, hey, where's like a, the Kubernetes dashboard, the management tool? Uh, what happened to Prometheus? That's like the popular third party engine they're using. None of that is still required. We're going to give you the AKS Kubernetes as a service, completely managed or manageable like any other Azure service. If you know just by clicking around in the portal where do uh, all the options are, if you know how to manage it from Azure CLI, if you know Azure Monitor, Log Analytics, App Insights, then managing Kubernetes somehow I would say becomes quite straightforward. So the namespace, that's the, the name of my cluster. And within I'm running my workloads. A lot of them like cube system that um, that's technically the, the container collection that you need to spin up and Kubernetes is doing that by itself to actually interact with the platform. So there's DNS, there's auto scaling, there's OMS for the log analytics and Azure monitor and a couple of customized container applications. Where it's going to tell me like I'm running five of them. Now, how do I tell my container like this is the image you need? This is the amount of copies that I want you to run. That's where the YAML file comes in. So I have one example somewhere in my GitHub. It's one of the, the most straightforward scenarios, but what I'm doing here is defining the name for my deployment. I'm going to use the parameter replicas 
where out of my Kubernetes environment, um, under the hood, in my scenario, it's using two virtual machines and it's deploying five copies. Now, I told you that Kubernetes is this orchestrator where it's going to try and be smart and performing load balancing across the different Kubernetes nodes, but also high availability. So I got five copies, five containers, five pods, as Kubernetes calls them, running, stretched over my uh, virtual machine backend. And technically, it means if I lose one of them, I still have at least two or three replicas running. Next, I'm going to tell where to find my image. So this is my PDT ACR container registry that I used in all previous demos and grabbing my container. And when it comes up within the cluster, run it on port 80. And lastly, because it can perfectly run fine as a internet facing scenario, but still protected, I'm defining up here that I want to run this behind an Azure load balancer. If it's only web apps um, running inside Kubernetes, then preferably using something like an app gateway because it gives you that additional level of security and web application firewall. So from here, it tells me that my container is running. So this is grabbed from my container registry that you can see up here and showing you what it looks like under the hood. I got my AKS resource group where I do have my physical resources and I got my load balancer where I should have my front end IPs. And just gonna grab one of these And that should give me my e-commerce once more, where this time let's connect to a different database backend. And five, four, three, two, one, there we go. Actually cool that it's only taking five seconds. So that should also give you some confirmation that ACAS is handling it a little bit faster than ACI and web apps because I didn't allocate an expensive plan. So that we're almost there. So it's not 60 minutes, I only used 50 minutes for now. So I talked to you about why using containers, what's the benefit, where does it fit? How are they different than VMs? How to compile containers, grabbing them from the Docker Hub if your requirement is in there. If not, you can compile them yourself using that Docker file. From there, running them on Azure, where ACR Container Registry is the starting point, Azure Container Instance for running them quick and easy, or moving to more complex scenarios using Azure Web App for containers or moving to like the ultimate option, um, Azure Container Instance. And with that, I'm not done because there's one more thing coming up because Dwayne promised you some giveaways and apparently I needed to provide some giveaways. But before closing, um, let's open it up for any questions. If there are any questions coming up. Hi, Peter, did I miss it? But did you have um, a link to the slides early on that we could see again or? Um, no, because I had no, no you, idea if you Peter, would share Peter the slide sent me, or not. Peter sent me the uh, slide deck in a PDF and I will attach a link to that when I upload the recording into the YouTube channel. Perfect, thanks. Yep. Good. Looks like no other technical questions. That's good. That means that or you're not paying attention, you falling asleep, thinking about the Christmas tree, or maybe the <laughs> session was that clear. Oh, no, this, this was absolutely <laughs> incredible. Thank you for sharing all of this. Good. So um, one last thing, because it's holiday season, so you obviously need to give something away. And next to that, because I'm super excited about my seven book that I published um, only last week, so it's uh, fresh from the press, as we call it. So if you're on Twitter, um, feel free to shout out. Use my tweet handle, PDTIT, obviously the Midwest Azure 365 user group. Include our friends from the Azure team. And if possible, try to be nice a little bit. And later tonight, I'll give away five free copies um, of my book, assuming that obviously five of you are actually tweeting about this. If you're watching this as a recording later on, 
Um, I would say try it out. You never know what happens during Christmas season. Um, it doesn't need to be later today or tonight. So Santa Claus is super friendly because you got nothing else to do this time around. And with that, I'm going to close down. Not going to steal more time away from your uh, precious hours in the day. So I would say thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed. You learned from it. And happy holidays. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. And uh, for those of you that uh, also attended, uh, Skylines Academy has has, uh, don't, has also uh, contributed a, a code for free for a free um, subscription on Skylines Academy as well. So. Those of you that are on, I'll reach out to you and uh, send you that code that you can register for that. So thanks to Brett Brett Bozik and uh, Nick Collier for providing that as well. So uh, one of the nice things about having a sponsor. (laughs) So so thanks, everybody, for attending. Peter, thank you very much for a great session. I, I definitely know much more about containers than I did an hour ago. So I appreciate that, which is I know as a trainer, the goal of every trainer out there is to uh, is to do that. So I appreciate it. And yes, cool. happy Thanks. holiday. Happy holidays to everybody. And I will uh, let everybody get to the rest of their day. And if you're taking a vacation and everything, have a happy and safe holiday. And we'll see you in January. Thank you, Dwayne. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.